come to me. I have to help. There's nothing we can do. I have to help. Alfie, we gotta go. How are you doing, Ian? Hi, hey, Jay. Yeah. Hi, Gareth. Thanks so much yeah. for doing this. Really appreciate it. No, thank you. My pleasure. Is that a Godzilla awesome. behind you? No. Oh, it is. It yeah. is. It is. Gareth, my, my girlfriend won that at the Sydney IMAX premiere for your film. Okay. Um, you know, when, it, when the film came out, we happened to watch it at IMAX Sydney. And okay. she always tells me that it's hers, not mine. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, we love well, God, God, Godzilla belongs to you now. I had to let it go a long time ago. So, <laughs> congratulations! I hope you're looking after it. <laughs> we we love it, and our friends who visit love it too. Um, I wanted to quickly say that I love the creator, and I was lucky enough uh, to be at SIGGRAPH last year, Gareth and Jay, for that Pixar Render Man session oh, yeah. that you were on stage for, which was really fun. That. The thing I want to ask you about that particular session is that you mentioned Gareth and Jay doing things differently on this film, particularly with visual effects, and that very tech-savvy crowd, I have to tell you, kind of went, really? Can you really do it like that? And then, of course, you did. Yeah. And I, I guess, you know, it was a really great thing to hear that you were doing things differently. But maybe, Gareth, for people who don't know, what was that really early on different methodology that you wanted to take with this film? Oh, gosh. It's a hard thing to explain. It's also quite simple at the same time. Um, mm. It's because it's it can sound not that different, if you know what I mean, or or it's something from like decades ago in the sense that we – but basically the way films filmmaking has evolved in the last decade or so or with digital technology is – Essentially, if it's a if it's a big genre film like a sci-fi movie, the first thing you end up doing is concept art, so artwork with you know building the world and really cool shots and things. And it usually that's the artwork that gets the film green lit and the studio excited. And then you're chasing that artwork the entire movie. So what happens is people sit down with you and they say, "Okay, well this crazy thing you've designed here." doesn't exist so what we'll do probably is we'll build that in a studio and then i guess you know then we'll, we'll have to put a green screen behind it and then we'll do the rest in in visual effects and you get you get very quickly boxed into this corner of, of everything's nearly that approach and 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 it's a real problem um, i used to do visual effects a long time ago for a living and and when you get given something that's essentially a foreground piece with green screen behind it um, it's a nightmare because someone's like going, basically saying, I don't know what this is. You figure it out, right? Like uh, make make this foreground thing look good by adding some random thing in the background, which is really, really hard to do. And so I always felt the better way to do that sort of thing is you go to a real location with real objects and real buildings and everything real. And then you film real people doing their thing and find nice shots and you do it like it's already there. Even if in your brain, that building's going to be a sci-fi building, not the one it is. That car is going to be a sci-fi car. You shoot it like it's all for real. And then, and then essentially change it all in the computer. And, and the problem with that is, is it means going to these real locations can get very expensive when you've got like 200 people coming with you everywhere. And on a big movie, 
you're normally are only allowed to go to two or three locations, you know what I mean, of significance. Mm. And and I was like, well, I want to go to like 80. And so the only way we could do it is if we got the crew small enough. So we beca- so we basically became like a guerrilla, you know, independent, small little movie uh, crew and, um, and traveled the world, mainly, you know, a lot of it in Thailand because of the pandemic. But we also went to like Indonesia, Japan, Cambodia, Vietnam, um, Nepal, and, and cherry picked just like sitting on Google, trying to find the greatest places in the world. We just went to all these great locations that were the closest thing to what was in the screenplay and shot it for real. And, and then in a sense, the big, big ask and was going up to a visual effects company and saying, I want to do it this way. What that means for you is you're going to have to sort of blindly agree to do the movie, not knowing what any of the shots are, not knowing what any of the ask is going to be, what not knowing any of the designs, like we're going to be doing on this all in post-production, but you've got to agree to do it. Otherwise I can't get the movie greenlit. And I thought we would have to get someone like some really naive brand new startup VFX company that was going to end up going bankrupt at the end of our movie. Uh, Cause it's such a big ask. And um, thank God uh, ILM knocked on our door and said, how do we get to do this with you? And, and so we did this little test together and they knocked it out of the park for very, very little money and got the film greenlit. And um, and I don't know if they are full of regret now. I'm hoping this Oscar nomination has helped a little bit, but they they pulled it off. You know, it was amazing. But what was that like, Jay, doing things a bit differently than maybe you and, you know, the whole ILM team have done for decades? It was It was scary, but also refreshing. And the scary part is probably is what you would expect. You you don't really know what you're signing up for. You're not no you you're not quite sure until you go through sort of a spotting session with your director of how much each shot is. I mean, you have the you have the script, and you have um, you're seeing the dailies, but you don't really know what these shots are going to turn into. I mean, we we saw a cut. Gosh, I don't even know how long it goes, but one of the earliest cuts we saw. The movie was pretty successful with no visual effects. I mean, the large, I mean, other than, you know, the nomad component where you're in space, you can't represent it. You still have all these locations. You still have really compelling actors. So that part was represented, but you don't know what it's going to, what you're going to do in terms of how many ships, how many robots, how many simulants, how big are these forms, how many weeks of uh, generalist time or Digimat or anything like that, how much Roto. So that part is a, a huge leap of faith. Um, once you fit, once you can wrap your head around it, it gets a little easier, and you can make you can start thinking about like oh the the horse trading element of like okay well we have to build this environment what's the but maybe we can do it in such a way that it's a lot cheaper we'll just do it as a two D projection or maybe we can we'll come up with a two D way to do robots in the background so we don't have to go through uh, lighting for all of those. So, we, you know, there's a number of, of things you can learn once you sort of get your arms around it. But at least originally, it's it's a really scary, scary moment, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> it gets easier. It gets easier after the first after you get it's almost like um, I don't I don't know what, what the best analogy is. But once you get over sort of the stage fright of having to perform and re- realize that this, you're going to have to to do these things. You can break it into smaller problems. The free, the refreshing part is like the imagery is amazingly cool, and you know really quickly that this is going to turn into something special. So that's the that's the other side of the coin, which is the the imagery that we were seeing from Oren and from Greg was was just so cool that we were really jazzed to be in 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 the project. Gareth, at that SIGGRAPH event, that sort of murmur of "Oh, can they really do it?" turned into excitement when you showed, I think it was the bridge sequence, and then you talked about it and you talked about how during the shoot you didn't necessarily know which human actor would be turned into a simulant or a robot. And people thought, oh, that's crazy, but then they thought that's brilliant because you get this naturalistic performance. I presume that was, of course, the reason. But what I really want to know is how did you decide what were some of the criteria? Did you change your mind ever? And I think you're allowed to. You're the director. Um, but tell me about that process. Um, 
Yeah, it's a double-edged sword. On the upside or on the downside, obviously, you've got a tracking nightmare because, you, you know, you just got people in normal clothing running around and you've got to turn them into a robot. On the upside, which is way better than the downside, is that you're not locked into anybody being a robot. And so typically we were saying, like, if you put a normal movie, everyone, you would see that we're all know, seen those behind the scenes of the people in the really stupid pajamas with the dots all over them and... You have those guys around, you know, you shoot those guys and then you cut it together and and you suddenly realize, oh, no, that that guy is out of focus and we just see his elbow. And we've got to go to the trouble of making him a robot, which costs thousands and thousands of dollars and it's going to have no impact on the audience whatsoever. So in our, our world, we we basically cut the movie together. And when we are sort of pretty happy with a locked section or a shot, even we would we would essentially wait until the sequence was finished because you can watch your eye on a cut, your eye goes to someone and then on another cut it goes to someone else. And so we were trying to just make the person that your eye went to become a robot. And then that way your brain doesn't have time to look at everyone else. And it just thinks it's, oh God, I've seen all these robots. There must be like 50 of them in this sequence. It's like, no, there's only seven, you know what I mean? But it would trick the brain. And so it was, if we were doing it again, I would, I mean, you know, I totally do exactly the same approach. I think it was really efficient and uh, it caused a lot of pain. I think there's a lot of, a lot of ILM artists didn't see their children for about six months, but <laughs> you know, there was big family reunions at the end of the post on this, like, you know, airports and things. It was a beautiful thing. But I do love the result. And Jay, obviously from your point of view, that did bring a more naturalistic, you oh, yeah. to the actual performance but was trickier perhaps it was definitely trickier but the, you know it's funny the, the motion capture the motion capture pajamas are all about the reality like you're what it, when we go down this road before it's witness cameras and the and the motion capture pajamas and all that kind of stuff you're all trying to you're trying to solve the most honest version of the of the question of where where are these limbs spatially and this is also true for lighting so same analogy um, but at some point you don't care that you don't, you're not really looking for what is the spatially correct. You want, you only have one plane of existence mm. for how you're interfacing with this movie and you care about what is the, like, the, this is, this is true everywhere in the movie that we didn't have reference We're we are creating plausible lighting that is also good cinematography. Hopefully we're not, cre we're not recreating the reality and i think that i think the visual effects artists sometimes get bogged down in like what is the actual uh truth if there's such a thing because we're not after truth that's not our goal at any point our goal is compelling imagery that serves the story and so whether the robot limbs are exactly in the right place or the elbows land in the same place as long as it feels like they're in the same place and it doesn't take you out of the movie we've kind of done our our job and that's also true for the way that we're lighting our robots, whether they're in, um, you know, that that oh that first sequence where they're in the um, the uh, what's the name of the location, Gareth, the, the where Gemma and JD are, Bali Beach, the, the beach house. Sorry, yeah. took me a second to took me a second to remember the whether it's in the beach house where it's sort of moody lighting. We want we want stuff that looks cool and it feels like what it was. And there were actors there on the day, so we're emulating what their lighting was, even if we didn't have their lighting reference. For what it was, if we didn't have an HDRI or or a um, or a, a gray ball, one one thing that is kind of funny is that Haroon actually became one of our best lighting references because of his bald head. We always knew where the lights were. <laughs> it was fantastic. <laughs> That's great. Yes, it probably passed it along to Ken. He'd love hearing. If you, that. if you hire a clapper, you know the the the, the, the clapper board guy. If he's yeah. bald, you don't need to do all that 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 silver That's group a, stuff. That's a great way to do it. Like you save so much time on set. Bald actors with one side of their head would be reflected, <laughs> and the other one would be just sort of a dull eighteen percent gray. <laughs> I mean, in some ways, it feels like going back to a time before we used um, gray balls and mirror balls and even color yeah. charts. Like, and of course, ILM did do that for a number of years, Jay. Yeah, you know, absolutely. until until you implemented that sort of workflow. Yeah, yeah, I know, and we and we're. The other thing is that every movie, there's always some portion of, you know, some plate that you don't have reference for, or you have four different HDRIs for it, and you're not quite sure which one it is. And so what you end up doing is you, 
you know, as artists progress in their careers and their um, abilities, they can pretty much tease out the lighting from looking at, you know, it's the same goals. You're looking for shadow direction. You're looking for color temperature. You're looking for, uh, you know, the, the, the proximity of occluding objects, all those sorts of things. And if you're a pretty crafty lighter, you, you don't necessarily, it's always helpful to have like the chrome balls, we always use that as a first pass. Like we'll render that just to see what the see what it is. But if it doesn't look good, we're chucking it, and we're and and so it's a it's a starting point, not an ending point. And that's something that we've been talking about for years. That the what is real is not never the you know there is no real that is. Um, if if I show let me I'll put it this way: if I had shown Gareth or we'd shown Gareth takes that didn't look like they're compelling imagery then and it like they're one of the things we often tried to do was try to feature off the the hole inside of our simulants heads, right? You want a little bit of a kick light. Now if that didn't exist on the set, that doesn't mean that they wouldn't do it if they had the opportunity to light that character with the with the hole in their head. So it makes sense for us to diverge from what the set lighting paradigm was in order to create more compelling imagery. And that's again, that's what we're really trying to do is we're trying to tell stories in that way. The other thing about the other thing about those um chrome ball hri whatever's is um what normally happens you've got a character stood there on set like alfie our little girl ai and and then something's like okay we're gonna get balls now and so she would have to leave and someone stand there and get and get the hdris right but if you're replacing her head and you're putting a ball where her head was probably like at least a third of the environment is her body right mm. so she's got this very red bright red kind of costume on and what we would find is the hris are not capturing that because she's walked away and so one of the first things we were doing you know we we're trying to figure out the movie was we're missing all this bounce light from from her outfit you know and so they ilm you know started, like jay and everyone was like trying to recreate like a fake little costume thing that was invisible so it'd get all that kick bounce because it would just feel a bit wrong until you did that and suddenly it'd be like oh now it's embedded you know it's all subconscious stuff but yeah we rendered her body I mean, we had a digi double with her with her outfit and the whole thing we would render her body it was included in the even if even if it didn't show up in the renders it was part of the the um uh secondary scat the secondary bounce elimination hmm. what you would expect <laughs> Gareth, can I ask you about the tests that you did, which I just love. I guess they were part of a, a scout, but then you were able to get ILM to do these tests. I particularly love, you know, the robot on the motorcycle and also the guy, I think he's smoking a cigarette and becomes a simulant. Mm. Um, Ian Comley and Shamin Chan happened to mention to me in a separate interview that possibly John Knowles supervised those which is a pretty good person to have supervised your tests, I suppose. Um, but tell me about the tests and what you what your aims were with that scout and with the tests. Was it to convince the studio? Was it to convince yourself? A bit of both. I mean, it was also quite a cheeky way to greenlight the film in that, you know, studios, you go and show them a load of artwork and the script and talk a good game and they can be very positive. But it's a big difference between saying really nice things to you and giving you tens of millions of dollars. And so there's this fear constantly that everyone's, no one really means it. We're not really going to get to make this film, you know. And so it felt like let's let's make this as undeniable as possible. So we're like, look, we don't want the money. Just give us a little fraction and we're going to go do a location scout. And to take the pressure off, we didn't tell them we were doing this, but we took a camera with us. And, we, and I just shot, I went with Jim Spencer, who produced my first film, and I just shot a load of, load of, like, um, holiday video art house uh, wank. <laughs> it's probably the technical term that you could never really show anyone. But it was all this beautiful textural, um, like, travel log stuff through these seven different countries. And we filmed, like, you know, um, Buddhist monks going into the jungles of Cambodia and and they weren't actors. They were just people that were just going about their lives. And I just was filming them like a documentary and then went with a begging bowl to ILM and said, you know, under the guise of, hey, look, let's just check this process can work. But really secretly and probably out loud as well, I was like, can you please help me green light this film? And they were really up for it. And and it was there was some super cool stuff in that test. Like there's a farmer. I just was in. um 
we would have been in, I think, uh, Indonesia. And I was just filming some guy plowing the land in a paddy field. And his mate was watching him with his, smoking a cigarette. And he just looked at, at me like, what the hell are you filming us for? And I was filming him and I was just smiling and filming. And he just was like, kept looking at me like, why are you still filming me? And there was just something about that. He was so naturalistic, the way he behaved and looked. That I was like, oh my God, if you could make him AI, like this would be the greatest CG performance I've ever seen because it's not a performance. It's someone really existing in a pure documentary way. And they did it, right? And, and then everyone reacted to that shot. And it was great having done that test because it became like a, a police badge during the rest of the movie because we had no data, no tracking markers. We There was just two of us and a camera. And so as we started to go, here's how we're going to make the film, you know, we're going to be like a tiny crew and do this. You obviously get loads of pushback, like, wait a minute, hang on, how are you going to do this? How are you going to do this? And we'd always go, but we only had two people on the test, you know what I mean? And it, we and it kind of allowed, I think if we hadn't done that, if ILM hadn't agreed to do that, it, we we would not have got to the end of the movie the way we did. I think we would have been like beaten up and told that we had to go back to how a normal film is made. But that test was so compelling and so clearly a unique looking type of film that the studio was like, go make two hour version of that and we'll be super happy, you know? And, and so I would highly recommend it to anybody <laughs> who wants to do some wacky <laughs> filmmaking approach. I love those tests so much and I feel like you preserved that look in the final robots and simulants. Um, I'm curious, Jay, did you constantly refer to those tests as you were continuing well, to go I, as well? It's funny. The, I foolishly thought that we were we were going to be able to repurpose so much of that geometry and we were like, oh, we've already done so much of the robots. But we definitely, we went back, we redesigned a whole bunch of stuff with James Klein, our production designer, we built a you know the seven heads and one common body and I would say a couple of different paint schemes for each of the robots, and um, but the idea was the same with the test right that we wanted to push them into our our characters in a way that was believable. Um, what was I forgot the first part of the question? Just that I felt like it was very much preserved into the oh, final yeah. work and whether you were able to keep referring to it. But I was going to ask if any tests made it into the final film. Oh, yeah. I think like three or four shots. No, there's way more. There was like basically, oh. yeah, I think so. The What happened at the very end, Yeah. you know, when you're in the last chance saloon of the, the film, the edit, I remember sitting with Hank Corwin um, and Scott. Um, Hank, I think, is a bit of a genius. He did JFK and The Tree of Life, which I think are the two best edited films ever. Mm. And and I, and we we for some reason I came across the test again. I think we would probably talk referencing it in VFX or I don't know what. But I ended up looking back through it or seeing some outtakes and just my heart sank. And I was like, "There's some really cool shots in here. Why are these not in the film?" And and Hank was just like, "Well, let's put them in." And yeah. and he just sat there and for a day, we just dropped them all in. <laughs> and and uh, I was so happy at the end of that day because I was like. And I would, I'm going to do this again. If I ever get to make another film, what I'm going to do is on Location Scout, and I've said this to Jim, is like whatever your time frame is for Location Scout, I'm going to double it and shoot stuff as we go. And because it's the only time in the life of a movie where you're completely left alone. Do you know what I mean? You, no one gives a shit. No one's asking you to do anything. You just can wander around like a tourist and just film stuff. And there's no pressure, no nothing. And you get this, this magical little pieces that you can't repeat. You go back to that same location and go, okay, now we want a guy on a moped and a, oh no, there's roadworks or the sunsets uh, not happening today or yeah. something else. And and so, so yeah, it was like this um, amazing little little grab bag of visuals that we managed to get in the film. Thank God. In that test, the guy with the cigarette and. Um is a simulant, I suppose, and there's the reveal of him turning his head and exposing that negative space is something that I feel the audience also loved in the final film for several moments. And I really want to dig down into that design with both of you and then execution because there's something in that uh, True Love documentary 
uh, Gareth, that you mentioned, which made me feel much more emotionally connected to those characters, partly because that empty space is like right down through their throat and, and further down. I just thought that was brilliant and really did make me connect with the characters. How did you get to that place? Well, James, so James Klein was the key uh, sort of design designer on this, all of this stuff. And we played around a lot. It was a lot of trial and error. I think when you make films or you do anything creative or artistic, there's this feeling that you are creating things, like it's your creation. And I think the more honest truth is you're discovering things that are already there. Like the reason they have an, an effect on someone else is because they're built of the same stuff you are. And and it is like universal reaction to an image or a piece of music or something or a story. And so you're not creating it, you're just finding it, right? And and so you can do trial and error approach to, to find that thing. You can like try 20 different things and see which one is the strongest. And so we we basically had two layers in Photoshop. So we'd have like the actor's skin, you know, the actual actor. And underneath we had like a crude, for want of a better term, I'll use the phrase Terminator, right? But some sort of like robotic skeletal thing underneath, just some crude like mechy skeleton. And then we would just try a million ways of deleting skin. Like, what if we did this? What if we did this? What if we did this? And we just found that lots of little things happen where if you don't, there's all these little rules start to appear where you go, oh, I would never have thought that ahead of time, but it seems to be true, is that you have to, when you do a cut or cut away some of the skin, you have to follow a natural contour of the human head. Um, so you like, so basically it's like a radius around the ear. Do you know what I mean? If you start making cuts and lines that are not part of the human form, it feels like something's gone wrong. And and, and it's, it's a bit like looking at someone and your brain goes, there's something wrong with that, that person. Like they got a disease or there's a mutation. I stay away. And so you have to kind of aesthetically, uh, kind of stick to the to, to nature's rules and flow with the shapes of the head. And one of the things we noticed that if we cut off the skin in the throat, uh, it was just a floating mask and it looks like the person is decapitated and and you just don't there's something uncanny valley about it where you reject it as a as a as a as a, a character um that you care about. But the second you let that skin attach to the body you it feels they're not decapitated and you can hug them and and then the great dilemma then was like i obviously you go if we're going to leave that skin in we want it to be narrow enough that whilst we see them we can also see the mech on the side of them like so we can look front on and go that's a robot that's not a human but life's easier for ilm if that if that skin at the front went a bit wider and then they wouldn't have to do much in the shot right like it'd be a 2d solve rather than a 3d one and so there's all these things where we get into this and you start to go, okay, life could be easier on 400 shots if we just change the design slightly, like massively easier. And there's a, so much pressure to change the design. But thank God we would end up in these conversations and go, look, guys, we're not, we're not trying to make a movie about the most efficient VFX, you know what I mean? We're trying to make a movie about the most emotional story and everyone knows what therefore the solution is and we would have you know quite intense conversations about it and and ILM were always the greatest in that they'd take a deep breath and they'd say okay let, let, let's go talk about it and they'd go away they'd come back and they go okay we figured out how to make that work and I, don't, I never knew what that really meant um, probably some magic solution Jay that you can explain now but I mean I just, I just like bite the bullet Ian, obviously you're, you're you're clued into visual effects in a, in a major way so it was usually some version of we had a technique that was a little bit of motion vectors a little bit of you know deforming head uh track tracking paired with our rigid body heads it was usually something down the road or a comp a comp technique that we could sort of get through it uh we're rarely trying to you know, the, the goal for this movie was how do we do this as efficiently as we can? Because we we're really conscious about how large Garris' vision was. And we wanted to make sure we had as much room in the in the budget to, to do as much as we could. So at every turn, we were looking for like what what's the cheater's version of this? What is the what how much do we have to render? How much do we have to match move? How much do we have to 
um, build in order to get through it. So a lot of times it was some reprojection work and some, you know, basically we came up with some techniques where we would track a, a face. And I don't know if this is too much of the weeds for you, but no, I'd we love would it. do a rigid body head track. And then we would do a motion estimation of the of the facial features, and then we would render uh, the rigid body version, and we would push the facial deformation into the renders, right? So we would be doing like a secondary layer of animation on top of that. And then we would lock down parts of the plate with stills or with dialing out basically what was the inherent motion in the plates. Um, that way we had rigid intersection points between the um, mechanical components and the head, right? Because you don't want to have the two elements shifting against one another, or else it looks like you've got basically a, a like a Freddy Krueger face that you've slapped on top of like a mechanical innards or, you know, one of those kind of horror gags. Um, but yeah, it was, you know, mad, mad, mad props to our comp soups in London and San Francisco who, who came up with these techniques. Um, it was it was tip, it was difficult, but we persevered like like all times. Yeah, that that work is incredible. What I also think makes it just feel like it is if you went out and shot it is that you can see, of course, the background through the hole in this head. And we talked about that a little bit. Was that just a mismatch of techniques, Jay? Like you obviously might have a clean plate sometimes, it was and that. otherwise you're just rebuilding one. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, a, it was, a, it was most, I mean, the paint tech, the paint talent on our, our show was, was phenomenal. The, mm. um, one of the things that's wonderful about the way Gareth shoots was also worked in our favor. He shoots these really long takes, like sometimes mm. 20, 30, et cetera, minutes. I don't know if it's really, is it 40 minutes? Is that your longest take? I don't know. Maybe. Someone said 45 the other day. So I don't know. 45 minutes, <laughs> wow. really long. So there's, there's usually, um, if it's not, those those um, locations are really well covered. So the, if we can, we would request additional footage from that and would usually find something that was not hidden by actors. So that was sort of the lucky coincidence. Other times it's a clean plate if we know it's going to be very difficult. Other times it's it's what is a, um, uh, could be the background, but may not actually be it. You know, it's it's not, again, it's, with all of these things, it's not exact. We're not looking for the reality. We're not. It's what could be the reality. And so, as long as it felt like it was something that was there, we we would track that in, that kind of thing. Hmm. I want to ask you both about just two of my favorite sequences or types of sequences. The first is, again, part of the bridge attack when those vehicles are pushing over, the stilted houses. I am not joking that when I saw this in the cinema, I thought maybe you had Gareth maybe shot some miniature elements for that, either of the vehicles or the stilted houses. I honestly felt the Sims and just the, the complex work there was miniature. And I just wonder whether you were inspired by anything you'd seen there done with models or miniatures. I mean, it's just great shot design, basically. Well, I think, I think that was maybe born out of the fact that... Um... So that was, I think the shot you're referring to, that would have been in Cambodia. So this was part of our really guerrilla shoot where there was minimal anybody. And we went to this stilt village and just went fishing for great shots and, 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 and had some costumes in our van. And we were like, so we just knocked on the door of the villagers uh, in this one little area and said like, I basically talked, I had a translator and, and we're like, would you like to be in a movie? And, you know, obviously look at people look at you, like, what the hell are you on about? And they're like, we, um, we're, we're make, shooting a film, you know, would you, for, and we paid them and everything. And, and so for like an hour or two, they played along, right. And they put on these costumes and they found it quite hilarious and, but they were really good at it. And they just started running and screaming and looking back and we tried to explain the height and everything. And I was shooting that with um, a guy called Andrew Michael Ellis as well, who had done the, um, some Terrence Malick films and, and so we were looking for all these like naturalistic things. And I remember just being like, you know, you, you sometimes shoot shots and I'm like, like nervous. or like, I got this feeling in me as I'm doing it where I'm like, this is going to be great. You know, you go like, I can't wait for ILM to get their hands on this. Cause I know it's going to be great. You know what I mean? You just can feel it in the shot and everything. And, and there was something about the way the light was hitting these um, wooden bamboo, whatever 
huts and they were like two three stories high really strange things because of the the, the way the river floods and and the the, the i think the, the the buildings themselves feel like models and so if you do that building justice in cg it's gonna look like and feel like a model in the way it snaps and bends and everything mm. and it was interesting because i thought I thought ILM were going to show me like all these like incremental works in progress of that shot, but you could also feel they just really wanted to like do a, do a slam dunk bullseye, you know? And so they didn't really show me it in progress at all. And then one day they just were like, mic drop, like, <laughs> by the way, we've done this. Have a look at this. <laughs> Jay, what was, I don't remember like the mic like? drop. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's because I thought I saw things along the way. I don't remember the mic drop. I'm glad it came across like a mic drop. Uh, you know, it's it's like everything else. You you build systems to build all these things. So there's there's a that was uh, led by um, Ian and our team in London. It's you build. It's it's like you would expect. I mean, there's no the the truth is probably a little less sexy, which is we build a system of recreating the whole structure of the house texture we define what the um what parts are cloth what the rigidity is of different physical forms we talk you know there's a the solvers a get of weights in terms of how much stiction and all those sorts of things these pieces get and then we run sims until it feels like it's the right thing and we you know noodle the dials and and render and then off it goes um I, it's it's what you know you you again it's you start thinking of like I don't know if this is exactly how it would work but it feels like that's how it would work and you kind of mm. we looked at a bunch of different reference along the way of of you know the huts that are similar getting knocked over and and there's a, one of the things that's wonderful about uh, the the fact that everybody has a phone in their pocket now is that it, everybody is documenting everything so it's pretty easy to find reference for most things so there are references of uh, whether it's a car crash or a uh, by car by a car crash or you know a truck running into something or whether it's it's um, hurricane or typhoon footage, you can usually find something that's sort of similar. All the devastating reference around. I know there's a lot of devastating. <laughs> I mean that's a blessing and curse. And now you know it's that was for that was for everything. That was for large explosions. That was for you know mm. crushing robots. We're I mean if nothing else. This is a movie where you you spend a lot of time looking at YouTube reference. Yeah, of that course. was actually part of the fun parts. One of the fun some parts. some dark dark places on the internet <laughs> that Jay's dark. been to. Yeah, my TikTok is now my. They seem they think I'm a really terrible person now because I'm always saving horrible horrible crashes. <laughs> ILM's webmasters got you on their watch list. Um, the the other kind of shot sequence I loved Gareth as well was the Nomad. Uh, scanning the land at different times. I just felt like that was so uh, scary, but also beautiful. Can you tell me a bit about the evolution of those shots? Well, um, so this dates back to the uh, Rogue One when um, I was at ILM. We were prepping that film and there was a concept artist who actually worked on this, Matt Wilson. Um He... I had promised him he was a big, and um, I am too. We were both like big alien UFO kind of fans. And we were like, one day when we go to America next week, let's go to Area 51, right? So we did. And we drove out into the middle of nowhere. We drove all the way up to the gate, but sort of parked halfway. And it's a very long story. And I'll cut to the chase. It was, it was the freakiest night of my life. We event, We basically got pursued by security in night vision and and it resulted in us driving away from Area 51 with a grid laser projection onto the mountains in front of us. And, and we and we both drew it afterwards and drew exactly the same thing. It was like this checkerboard pattern that that projected down and, and like and rotated and, and and sort of flickered and then went off. And it was obviously silent and it scared the living shit out of us. And we thought we were gonna get killed by Apache helicopters or something, we're being tracked didn't make any sense and it happened twice and then after we calmed down and the next day and we all got over it it was like oh my god we gotta put that in a film you know 
and and I, I i was trying to i tried to put it into rogue one and i tried to put it into uh, uh something else i was working on at one point and then this came along and i was doing this and and i thought oh my god here we go this is my chance to do it and and so it was it, i just loved that all seeing eye it was a bit like a video game you know like you know i don't i'm not a gamer actually um not since 1985 i haven't really played computer games but the um you know like you have those graphical overlays that tell you like little um or it's like your head up display in a, in a fighter pilot mm. cockpit. it the idea of actually that being literal like, like rather than being projected on a screen and, and and augmented for the pilot the idea it's projected on the actual ground for the soldiers you know like a like a real-time battle uh you know information thing and i don't understand it beyond that but it just there's something quite contradictory about it because there's a stealth mission going on where you're supposed to be secretive but at the same time there's this giant intimidating bright light coming down mm. which felt it again i can't justify it it's like a lot of the things in filmmaking there's there's you can get into logic and my my Joke always reaction to that is okay. Well, it's I guess we're not going to go to the logic awards with this movie, right? Like, <laughs> I don't ever want a logic award on my shelf. Um, the award for best logic is like those movies are boring and shit. Um, you just go for what feels like or what has an emotional impact on you and makes you give you goosebumps mm -hmm. or something. And that imagery was like. Uh, it doesn't really feel too familiar. This like it feels like you know always looking for something like even it's a hybrid of other films or some other experience. What's what's the little thing that you've not quite seen that you know you could put in this movie and 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 a nomad and those visuals were definitely one of those. Hmm. Jay, I'm not 100 percent sure if that was an ILM specific shot or sequence or a vendor yeah, we did one, a but... we did a bunch of them yeah there i mean there are a little bit everywhere because they're they're, you, they're omnipresent like the mm. yeah in the movie so we did the beach component and i mean there are a few different places where we put them yeah i mean it's cool it was a cool it was a cool thing to develop um you're never quite sure how it's gonna work out but we got pretty lucky we were able to get like a nice reflective beam onto the water which was really cool and we did a couple of when they sweep through the over the um rocks and and uh the the foliage is a fun thing to work through awesome we've talked a little bit about how this was maybe using some old school visual effects methods but of course it also used new methods including uh virtual production and stagecraft gareth um and i think i saw you doing some uh you know virtual camera scouting which I feel like you'd also done a bit on Rogue One, um, you know, perhaps some of the earlier stuff done at ILM with that virtual scouting. How yeah. did you want to take advantage of things that ILM had done in the meantime, you know, with Stagecraft and other visualization tools so far? Yeah, on Rogue, John Noll was very good and and innovative with seeing how, you know, I like to work and be very intuitive with the camera and not so prescriptive ahead of time but like find it in the moment slightly and so he managed to figure out using vr controllers you know like uh, i thought i might have some down here i've got some somewhere but they um basically they they stuck one to the back of an ipad and it made the ipad like a controllable camera and it worked really well it's how we got those shots um of the death star reveal with the big radar dish going mm -hmm. into the death star and all that like never would have thought of that but as you explore and, and turn shadows on you go oh this could oh this could flow to this and this and it, and it helps you find stuff and so you know obviously things have come a long way since then and and so ilm you know were also very kind of uh aware that our whole movie had this vocabulary to it that was organic and and sort of like found you know compositions and so it was like, oh my god, when we get into space and it's all three D models, how are we going to do this? And it and and it, and so they there was a day I got to go up to San Francisco, and essentially they had the whole volume there converted, and I had a little um, virtual monitor that was a camera, and I could basically just find my shots, and you could shrink the scale of the world or increase it, and I shot the shit out of that thing. I think I came home with six hours of footage. It was crazy. 
because there's like there was so many opportunities and i you know in your brain you're like i'm not going to get to come back suck every single like, like we still didn't know exactly how the third act was going to be so it was like trying to find every kind of angle and shot i possibly could and it was a nightmare going through all that material and trying to find things you know as as you know uh, as a basis for the but they had the time code and everything so if we picked a shot they would have the virtual camera of that same move and with and with um stagecraft like we on again rogue one we had um led screens in the cockpits that we thought might be a cool way to do interior spaceship shots and and then one by one that's evolved that became obviously stagecraft that feels like oh that's changing filmmaking and greg fraser being a big part of that who's our dop as well um and so I was always very jealous watching stuff like the behind the scenes of the Mandalorian going, <laughs> oh man, that's the sort of thing. I wish I was doing that. And then and then, you know, got my chance. Cause as we it's a weird thing because it's an it's it's not the cheapest approach to doing a guerrilla film is going to Pinewood and doing stagecraft. But there was this strange mentality that happens where the studio know they're making a big film and and when you say at times it's going to be five of us with a camera in the Himalayas, it get people get very nervous about that. But if you say, but don't worry, we're going to do like three weeks at Pinewood using the Mandalorian technology with ILM, where we do all the space stuff. Everyone, they weirdly breathe a big sigh of relief and go, oh, thank God, you know what I mean? Like something proper. And <laughs> and so we they were happy to pay, or it felt like they were happy to pay for that. And But in terms of how all that's done, it's... Jay can take over because it's all black well, magic. I think Gareth knows more of these laying letting on. But the I mean it's well, let me first talk with the about the virtual camera stuff. Hmm. So we um we knew well first to know whether it makes sense is to know whether how Gareth shoots his movie where he's the camera operator and he takes huge authorship over finding frames and wants to is is constantly searching for shots. So we knew that we needed an equivalent version for our third act. So it made sense that we would take our our nomad, we'd previs out a number of the beats of what's going on, and then we'd get that into, I think at the time it was in, we brought it into Helios, as I recall, which is our 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 um stagecraft render. So you get um you get shadows and um global illumination, things like that. And then we had a, um, using our virtual camera tools, we're able to emulate any number of film backs. So we knew what the film back was for the Kawa 75. And we were able to create some new tools so Gareth could operate, basically treat it like a, a model, right? So was, we could shrink the world down. We had, And we added some additional tools for dampening so little small movements didn't become wildly jittery, that kind of thing. And so what you can do is you can create, like like Garrett's saying, he can he can sort of search around, and all of that's recorded with time code, and then we have camera position. And the hope is that we find shots that can we don't have to work out the camera exactly. I don't know if it exactly worked out that way, but we definitely got much farther along because we were able to pull the time code, which was coming from his cut, then it entered, then we would pull those camera takes, and that became the camera that becomes the first um, take for for camera. For stagecraft, so that was I, I thought that was probably the some of the most helpful six hours or eight hours or whatever it was um, that we had because we knew that two things happen when you do the virtual camera. One, you get the director really understands the space and is able to explore it, and they don't sort of start fishing for shots that they don't have. They know exactly what's what's there. And the other thing is that you kind of get a buy-in also. Not to say this say this in, in front in, in front of Gareth, but He's because he's the architect of the camera move. He has more ownership of it, and I think it's ultimately what we want. We want we want to get him, Garrett, to get as close to the pixels as he as he's able to. And I think that's the hard part with visual effects in general is you're always working through someone. You're always working through you know a series of people. Um, with stagecraft, you know the the goal is always try to find locations for everything, but there's no location for space. There's no location <clears throat> for our biosphere environment. There's no location. I guess we could probably could have found something a little bit for our our um, airlock, but we were trying to find places where where can we knock off a bunch of shots, and advance the element of production design at the same time we're finding shots. 
So we had some prep time with um, Fraser Churchill, who led our, our stagecraft team to build the biosphere and the airlock. And so we got those up on their feet pretty early on. And so that was that uh, just as a matter of process, that, that unlocked those assets for um, host production. But it also gave us an opportunity to see how they were looking in a kind of a, a real way and pick up the shots. And it's I think we've spoken about this multiple times with multiple people, but it's really advantageous to have your actors being able to look at something instead of big blue walls. That's the that's the I think the worst for an actor. And so when our actors were there, they could understand what the environments were. This is we, we've talked about this a bunch, but it also it helped us find again, helps us find shots and it helps us define the lighting and it helps us do it in a way that even if the shots don't become the finals, if we replace it for, for de deconstruction or we have to replace the, the floor, the stage floor, we get it really far really quickly. And we know we, we have sort of visibility on what it's going to eventually be like. And that to me is the ultimately the best part about stagecraft is to answer the question of what is it going to look like at a much earlier place in the schedule. Hmm. Uh, Gareth, you mentioned being jealous of the Mandalorian team. Uh, now you've jumped in and you probably are the perfect director that could tackle that and, you know, given you're operating as well. But how did some of the actors handle it too, especially the actor for Alfie? I felt very naturalistic in that space environment, you know, turning things, the vault and, and the doors. It just It just felt like you got that same naturalistic feel, even though you're using this high-tech stuff with stagecraft. It's very easy to forget you're in stage, you're in a sound stage, basically. Um, it just like when you're on location, because you're pretty much your 360 degree view is this is all this stuff is this is this space station. Um, it, it really messes with your head in a way that's quite unique. Like, um, so for instance, we had the biosphere in one scenario, and then we had the escape pod bay in another scenario, and we would we did. I think the skate pod first and then the biosphere, I can't remember, but we did, I was standing in one of them and I would talk about the other one, like as if it was far away. And like, you'd go when we were in the, and I was like pointing as if it was somewhere else. And they were like, no, that was right here, right where you're stood. You know what I mean? Like, and you knew it in the back of your head and you're like, man, this is so weird because I felt like we're, we're in a completely different place now. That's like far away from that place. It transforms so quickly like it's not you have to build for three months, you know. What I mean, you literally wheel this stuff out and the other stuff in, and you press, you know, a lot of magic buttons with a group of people, and and the whole new set turns up. I think the thing that it is 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 interesting about it is it you have to make all your decisions before you film. Like a lot of people mm. view visual effects as this, we can punt this problem downstream. You know, green screen is like, yeah, yeah, we'll figure it out later. You know, like kind of you don't have to know right now, but with stagecraft. It's like building a set, but in CG, you have to basically build it and and commit to all these things. And and I remember um, that was very rare on our film because we were using real locations. It was one thing we were like building in a sense. And um, I remember like we were in the middle of the jungle in Thailand and I'm having to get on these calls and they gave me a little laptop to take with us wherever we went. And it had a VR helmet and there was like tech people helping me set it up. And basically we were like live streaming with ILM and doing little, um, you know, scouts of, 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 of basically these like, skateboard bay and, and like, could we make that bigger? And what about the lighting on this? And, and it was a bit of a head fuck when you suddenly take this off and you're back in the jungle and you go, I can't quite believe what I'm doing for a living. I was just with my heroes at ILM in, on, on, you know, in a space station. And now I'm, now there's crickets outside and you know and, a, and a, a beach and it's like throws your mind like how far this technology's come yeah it was a helpful technique because we were we basically all of the all of the because that was all in unreal we had a vr headset that was driving all the set design parts yeah it's a nice way to do it i do it's remember amazing. i do remember the lighting was was a really interesting exercise because it, you know, this is all new stuff. Well, to me, it's new stuff, right? You know, like it's not been done a million times. And so like everyone gets their own little, hey, we should do it like this rather than like this. And 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 having Greg on board as well was super interesting. And and we, so you'd render stuff and 
you know, like maybe the renderer, it felt a little bit CG at times or something, you know, because it's real time. And and I remember at one point, and I don't recall how we how you guys ended up solving it, but I remember at one point, it, just to get take the CG edge off it, we got like real world circular environment. So I went on the internet and stole things like from particle accelerators or tunnels systems and tried to find lighting that looked cool. And basically in Photoshop, stuck it over the top and changed the modes and just tried to find a blend where it was like, okay, that's the CG version. And now this is the photo real version. Okay, go make it look like that and go away. Cause it's the only way to give feedback. And then they would, I don't know what they did, whether they projected that stuff on or what, who knows, but yeah, you'd come back the next time you'd be like, Oh wow, that's so much better. And, and it's like, you were, you're not just designing the thing. You've got to light it and it's got to have all the texture and it's, it's a, it's a big request. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not a cheat to go use stage. No. It's like as big as building one of the biggest sets you could think of. Right. And you're living with it for a really long time. So you gotta be careful. Yeah. It's definitely yeah. difficult. Man. Well, I'm, I'm so glad we got a Gareth Edwards view of stagecraft in this film and that you could include it. Um, guys, thank you for going into all that detail with me. Um, congratulations again on the film. And I really enjoyed talking to you about it. Thank you so yeah, much. Thanks so much. Thanks Ian.